And that was on Sargo. Sargo was a hard luck boat. What we call a hard luck boat. If something could go wrong, it happened to Sargo. Now, I don't know why, but it did. We were going to Westpac, and we had a bunch of kids from the academy riding us. And these kids have been told, you don't touch anything. I mean, if you have to go to the head, you get somebody to flush that head for you. You don't go in there and start twisting valves. Because they didn't know what they were doing. And uh, we had a minor leak back at the hydraulic plant. And there was three accumulators. Each accumulator could be the main accumulator, standby accumulator, and uh, accumulator that would be off, not used. And depending on the valve line, if you shift these around to make either one of them that type of what, what it was doing. You know. He had isolated the lead accumulator because it was the one that had the leak. And he had shifted the lead from the lead accumulator to the standby accumulator. But hydraulics, when the, when the pump is running, the oil has to go someplace. When the accumulators are full and aren't using oil, the pump goes into bypass. It discharges right back into its suction because you can't, you can't compress liquid. Frenchy LeCousier, kid from Louisiana, was the one that done it. He was working on the, on the accumulator. And when he shut, or when he isolated the lead accumulator, he isolated it when it was full. So the pumps were in the bypass mode. And he forgot to shift one valve. So during the course of uh, the moving, we, we were running, I guess, around 200 feet. And the planes when they're using rise and dive on their planes, the helms when they're using right and left on, the, on a rudder. But they're using rudder, we're using oil. Well, they were taking oil out of that standby accumulator. But the pumps were still in bypass because he forgot to hit that one valve. Standby accumulator went empty. That particular class of submarine, escape class of submarine, that particular class of submarines, on loss of hydraulic pressure, the planes failed in full dive. Now, I had just come off watch back after. I knew how we were going about 15 knots, standard speed. I got up out of my rack. I'd just gone to bed. I tried to put on a guy's shoes by the name of Hargis. Hargis. His shoes were 15s. I wear 11s. I couldn't get them tied right. And I was sitting there in, in the deck trying to get these shoes on. Now this is shortly after just a couple of months after we lost Thrasher. And at dawn we had this uh, hellacious down angle by this time. And after you ride the boats for a while, you, you know when the boat is was operating right and when it's not. And you, it, it, you develop a feel for it. And I knew something's wrong. And I'm thinking to myself, I've got to get back to maneuvering. Then I'm sitting there thinking I can't get back there because the down angle's too much. And I'm thinking, well, I go to control. And then it's done, well, I can't get to control with this down angle. And I didn't black out, but I quit thinking. I mean, my mind went blank. Because I, I was terrified. And that's, that's the reason I found that there's a difference between being scared and being terrified. And I was terrified that night. It's the only time in my life I've ever been terrified, and I don't want to happen again. But uh, one of the kids, the periscope stands on the nuke boats are side by side instead of fore and aft. And around the periscope stand was a railing, about waist, waist high. Directly in front of the periscope stand was a hand pump or hand crank for the rudder. Now the hand cranks for the planes were on the back of the planes when seats. But they had such a hellacious down angle, they couldn't get back there to them. The air manifold operator was 
he normally was still watch behind them. He was jammed up on top of them. The chief of the watch and the diving officers jammed up on top of these guys. Nobody could get to those cranks on the back of their seats to crank the planes out of full dive. This young kid in the academy, the railing around his around the waist high stopped him from going off the periscope stand. But he was leaned over and the handle, or the crank handle for the rudder, directly in front of him. The planesman had shifted everything into hand, but they couldn't do anything. This kid cranked in hard right rudder. And the way that particular boat was built, that class of boat, hard right rudder made the stern squat. Well, when he cranked in hard right rudder, the boat leveled off. And the guys were able to get to the stations and got us out of it. We were way below test depth, and I won't mention that depth, or this test depth. And so what would happen if you, if you kept going? Somewhere, we would implode it. I have no idea where. See, the uh, Navy says a test depth. All right, for instance, uh, the Gato class was, the Gato and the Baleo class were World War II boats. The Gato, her pressure hull was a half inch thick of high strength steel. The Baleo class was three quarter inch thick of high strength steel. The Baleo class boat, her test depth was 412 feet. Now the test depth is, the Navy says you can go to test depth as many times as you want to, you're all right. The test depth was figured at a third of crush depth. But nobody knows what crush depth is because ain't nobody ever comes back and tells you. <laughs> but that kid out of the academy saved us that night. He had he had no idea what he was doing, and he had been told that all had been told. You don't touch anything. Yeah. But, but luckily he did. What was his name? I don't know what his name was. I, I, yeah.